modern cities. Miles of beautiful beaches. Gorgeous scenery. Tourist heaven. It's not Miami, it's not the French Riviera, it is Cyprus. And there is something wrong here. Over 2,000 Cypriots are missing, mostly civilians, yet they vanished in the chaos of war. This is a country with unanswered questions. A bloody conflict erupted in 1974, and Turkey took control of over one-third of the land. Now, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots are kept apart by a few United Nations soldiers and the thin green line drawn on a map. And yet, most people in the world couldn't tell you where this country is or why there is so much fear, pain, and hatred or why there is also a longing to reunite, bury the dead, find the missing, and erase the thin green line. Among the missing is an American from Detroit, Motor City, USA, Andreas Kasapis. For 20 years, his family has never stopped looking. Every day. I pray every night, every morning. My God make a miracle for me. My boy, uh, he was uh, 70 years old. Uh, he was in Cyprus at the time. He was going to the American Academy and graduated from there. He was a very nice boy, quiet very friendly with everybody, and beloved for, from everybody. The Turks entered the, the house. Um, they knocked the door down, and they pointed the guns to us, and they, the, the Turks said to my dad, we wanted, we're taking your son, and my dad said, you can't take him, he's an American citizen, and they said, we do not care about Americans, we are taking him with us. I had a small American flag in front of my house, they took the flood and cut in pieces. So my dad proceeded in giving, showing them his American passport, and then at that time they hit my father with one of the guns in his stomach. And they said, we do not care about Americans, we're taking them with us. And then my brother took off his cross and his American coin around his neck, and he, he handed it to me, and he said, save it for me for when I come back. And then he turned to my dad and said, don't worry, Dad, I'll be back. And they... They walked out and they put him on a tractor and that was the last we saw or heard from him. He's been taken away from the Turkish Cypriots. He was 17 years old. And I, I never saw, saw him since then. That's uh, 20 years now. It's 20 years. 365 days a year. It's hard not knowing if he's riding in a Turkish prison. Where is he? If, they, if they, my boy is alive, they're going to release him. No matter what they've done to him all those 20 years, probably they've done a lot of bad things for him, you know, beating and everything. Just leave him alone, leave him free, and I forgive you. Uh, I have nothing, nothing to say against you. I'm not going to go after you, you know. I'm, going, I'm not going to sue you. For nothing. I forgive you for everything. Just let my boy free. My heart broke it for me, for my son. There were actually five Americans that were among the missing, but Andreas Kasapis is the only one young enough to still be alive today. My parents were born in Cyprus. It's an independent island in the Mediterranean, 500 miles from Greece and 50 miles from Turkey, and it is populated by Cypriots of both ethnic backgrounds. They used to live side by side, but now 
Turkish Cypriots live in the north and Greek Cypriots live in the south. In our Brooklyn, New York home, we spoke Greek. When my mother died, I wanted to honor her memory by doing what I could to solve the Cyprus problem. So on the anniversary of the Turkish invasion, I went back to my ancestral homeland to find out more about the people, the culture, and about what happened to the missing. Lefkara is my family's village. I visited the family home when my parents were alive, but it had been many years. The story of the missing drove me to Cyprus, but I was struck first by the warmth of the people and the beauty of the land. I went for a look around the village. In Cyprus, everyone comes from a village even if they haven't lived there for years. Person's village is part of their identity, like a family name. What's the problem in Cyprus? Yes, the problem for me as a Greek Cypriot is that the Turks invaded the island 20 years ago. In the north, they have proclaimed themselves the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. But no country has recognized them except Turkey. Because we are not a recognized state, we are only recognized by Turkey, uh, this creates major problems for investment because capital is, is shy for, uh, for, uh, when there's a political problem, they don't come and invest. The economy is tied closely to Turkey's. The standard of living is lower than the South's, though tourists are discovering its unspoiled character. But Greek Cypriots are not allowed in. Turkey's soldiers are everywhere. There are 35,000 stationed in the north. The Turks have painted two giant flags, one Turkish and one Turkish Cypriot on the side of a mountain. This view dominates the divided city and taunts Greek Cypriots reminding them daily of the unresolved conflict. One day, soon, they will try to take over the whole of the island. And I will die. But what they don't understand is that I will die fighting, and I'm ready for that. Because I have this thing inside me, it's eating me. And everybody has, every Greek Cypriot. It's the way they understand it. It's the way they, they teach it in their schools. So a lot of young people, a lot of Greek youth, run to the border in this day and say, we want our lands back, because they think their lands are occupied, although, as you could see here, there's no occupation, but 
we are just living like them. We are just living in peace. Since 1974, 80,000 settlers from mainland Turkey have moved to northern Cyprus to settle in Greek Cypriot homes. Their presence angers the Greek Cypriots who have hopes of returning to those homes. We can see our uh, villages and our home. We, we are not just refugees, we are refugees in our country. I tried several times to go inside to go to my home. But unfortunately, the Turkish troops, Attila's troops, they arrested me. But I shall never stay without strangle. Believe me, girls, believe me, women, we must make a strangle to return to our homes. In our homes in North Village, in Cairo. In the South, the Republic of Cyprus is a democracy, a modern member of the family of nations. The economy there is booming. Cyprus is the world's sixth largest registrar of ships. Tourism fuels the boom, and why not? The weather is great, and the water sparkles, and the wine is world renowned. Football is the island's passion. For more important games, every man in my village gathers on Main Street, pulling together to shout at the screen. Many of the people in Cyprus still make their living in agriculture. Irrigation has allowed agriculture to prosper. Sheep and goats are important to Cyprus. All you've got to do is stop in a local taverna on a busy Saturday night to see the evidence. <laughs> Cypriots need to go to tavernas to eat, sing, and talk. It's the only way they keep their anger and frustration from exploding. The specialty of all Cypriot restaurants is Mezedis. It's a grab bag sampler of the menu, and it changes every day. Thank God for the Tavernas and the United Nations forces. Now, the United Nations force in Cyprus has dwindled to under 2,000. They are stretched thin along the lifeless strip of land that divides the country. And we're here to monitor the peacekeeping agreement that was drawn up between the two sides at the end of the conflict in 1974. And we do that through an active, program of patrolling within the buffer zone and monitoring from observation posts that we man 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The UN forces took me through the buffer zone. It's an uneasy no man's land separating two opposing armies. Yeah, we're at the front of the embassy now. You can see from the bullet holes up there that this was the scene of fighting the buffer zone is frozen in time, exactly as it was during the invasion, when Greek fought Turk, house to house, street to street. 
It's one of the most densely militarised areas in the world, yet still one of the most peaceful. Ultimately, we would like to leave and get both sides to live in harmony together. Whether what that will happen has yet to be seen. At places, the buffer zone is only the width of the road. Then you get hold of the troop commander here, all right? We haven't been filming you. Turn, turn the camera away. Hello, 2-9, this is 2-1 Delta. A reference to the filming incident. I've spoken with Everyone is nervous in the buffer zone. Us ...in future if we will contact them through the Wolf Regiment landline, reference filming, and I've said that we'll comply with that. Over. The next day, Turkish Cypriot demonstrators set the buffer zone on fire to protest a long-standing economic embargo imposed by the Greek Cypriots. Incidents like this are common and dangerous when both sides are poised for war. It's ironic that Cyprus is the home to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and many of the world's armies have passed through here. Cyprus has been conquered by several conquerors so far. Uh, we had here the Phoenicians, we had the Persians, we had the Greeks, we had the Romans, we had the Byzantines, we had the Lusinians, we had the Venetians, we had the Turks, we had the English. Hiroki Dia, 7,000 years old. It looks remarkably similar to my home village of Lefkara. Same view, same rock walls, same narrow streets. This Phoenician city of Amethus was founded a thousand years before Christ, complete with indoor plumbing. The city was pillaged for building stone in the 1860s and now lines the walls of the Suez Canal. Greece's influence began around 2000 BC. They brought their language, culture, and people they wanted Cyprus for its strategic location and also for its copper. The land was so rich with copper that when water from the Aleppo pine trees fell on the ore, a chemical transformation took place and a workable metal was created naturally. The word Cyprus, or in Greek, Gypros, actually means copper. Copper was discovered quite early on the island. Immediately, the island became uh, uh, very rich and very prosperous. For the ancients, it was perfect. For spear points, shipbuilding, and armor. That was before the discovery of iron. Uh, copper was very important. It was as important then as the discovery of the atomic energy now because it was used in the war. Most of the trees were cut down to fuel the copper furnaces. The countryside was stripped bare. The young shoots that would replace them never had a chance because of the grazing habits of these sheep. These wild ones called mouflons exist nowhere else in the world. But the real culprits are their domestic cousins. These sheep, raised for the meat and wool, will eat almost anything but the most distasteful plants. The shepherd knocks down the dead olive leaves to feed his flock. These olive trees may be a thousand years old. Reforestation efforts use ancient Roman terraces to hold the new young trees. 
Rome left a legacy of great architecture. Their cities, their tombs carved from the living rock, even their floors were great. The Roman Emperor Constantine made Cyprus the first Christian state. And this basilica is the world's oldest Christian church. In 1571, Cyprus was conquered by the Ottoman Turks. From this point on, Cyprus developed a schizophrenic character because 18% of the population was now Muslim living among devout Greek Orthodox. Generally, Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots used to live as peaceful neighbors. This is a Greek Cypriot house. This was a Turkish Cypriot house. Uh, there was socializing, of course, but there was always the two sides maintained their own separate way of life, religion, and uh, culture. And uh, there was a limited degree of uh, interaction in terms of marriage, intermarriages between the two things, of course, because of religious and other reasons. Even Jesus Christ came to earth, God came to earth, and uh, was unable to make people uh, come together and be uh, all uh, in peace. Like many troubled countries, the recent history of Cyprus begins when it became part of the British Empire. The India was the prize jewel on the British crown and uh, the road to India acquired a kind of mythical importance in the minds of the British politicians. So they had the route through Suez, but it could only take one ship to scuttle in the canal to block the route. So the British had a wild idea to have another route starting from the coast across from Cyprus. Churchill called it his unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean. A Greek Cypriot militant faction began to rebel. They called themselves Ioka and they wanted the Brits out. By the 1950s, things had begun to unravel. They dreamt a 4,000-year-old dream of unification with Greece, which they called Enoses. But this desire for Enoses terrified the Turkish Cypriot minority. When the British took over the administration of Cyprus from the Ottomans, then the Greek Cypriots started agitating for Enosis, or the union of Cyprus with Greece. And that is when trouble started, and the uh, neighbors turned against each other and uh, we started having uh, all this problem uh, coming to our present day uh, situation. The Brits clamped down, which angered the people, and popularized the cry for independence. A guerrilla war smoldered. Britain actually used the tactics of dividing the communities on a class-based system by putting managerial and working classes into professions and setting one against the other. It's a classic system of divide and rule. And a terrible decade began as hundreds of Turkish Cypriots were used by Britain to fight their Greek neighbors. This rather classy shopping district in downtown Nicosia is Leader Street. And nowadays, it's only murderous to the budgets of sun-dazed tourists. But in 1955, it was the site of so much carnage that it was called Murder Mile. By 1960, the Brits had had enough. Tonight you go to sleep in a British colony, 
Tomorrow you wake up in an independent republic. Cyprus became a democratic republic with a constitution whose continuance was guaranteed by Britain, Greece, and Turkey. The immensely popular Archbishop Magadios became president with Dr. Kachuk, a Turkish Cypriot, as vice president. But peace was not to last for long. From 1963 to 1964 was a time many call the Troubles. Greek Cypriots accused Turkish Cypriots of rebellion. The Turkish Cypriots felt themselves victims of persecution. The Greeks, they killed about 30 of my family. They said, the, the Greeks are coming, the Greeks are coming. So one of my uncles said, why don't you everybody hide and don't get out? So everybody hide, you know, and they, the Greeks came and they said, come on out, we're not gonna kill you. Come on out, we're friends. And so, so, so most of them, they came out, then they killed them. No one will ever know who really started it, but over 500 people were killed during the summer of 64. She was eight years old, and the mother was like 30 years old. They raped her, they cut her breasts, and they cut her arms, and you know, they couldn't like, find all her parts. <laughs> so, you know, I, this is very emotional for me. You know, I don't understand why they did it. The first ever United Nations peacekeeping force landed in Cyprus and imposed an uneasy calm. A line was drawn to separate the warring factions in the capital of Nicosia. Called the Green Line, this division in the capital was a small rip in the fabric of this country. But that rip was persistent, and soon the entire country would be torn into two. On July 15, 1974, a fascist junta from Athens joined forces with the Greek Cypriots of Iokabi. A bloody coup d'etat toppled the democratic Makarios government overnight. Magadio's supporters were butchered, and the constitution was trashed. Turkish Cypriots, led by Ralph Dintash, appealed to Turkey to fulfill its contractual role to protect them. They didn't have to ask twice. On July 20th, Turkey entered Cyprus. Greek Cypriots call it an invasion. The Turkish Cypriots call it an intervention. But the net result was the same. The Greek Cypriot National Guard, weakened by the junta, was no match for Turkey's army. They bombed the capital of Nicosia, landed on the beaches, and steamrolled across the land. I was only 11 years old and I remember that day my mother woke me up early in the morning and told me, Maria, we have to leave. We have to leave uh, now because the Turkeys are going to take the, our home and our place. We have to leave to save our lives. I was only a child. And the only thing that I was thinking at uh, that moment is and asking, Mama, can I took my, uh, my games with me? Can I take my, my clothes? My... No, she said, we have to leave. We have to leave right now. And I heard the voice of the aeroplanes. They are bombing uh, it. Uh, It was a very terrible moment. 200,000 Greek Cypriot civilians fled to the south. 60,000 Turkish Cypriots fled to the north. 
When I was there, refugees gathered, determined to return to their home village of Fiyya, now in the Turkish north. The reason why we are here is to tell everybody that we are fighting in order to go back. We don't forget what happened to Cyprus and we will not let anyone to forget it. We want to go back and we know that someday we will go back. Point to your house. You, you pointed it before. Where is the it? The one on the left of the pole there, the white one. Can you imagine what my feelings should be? Just seeing your house and not to be able to get in. You want to walk to go back to your house where you were born. I mean, it's your right. It's a human right. Someone has taken this right from us and we are demanding it back. Here, the buffer zone is wide. Greek Cypriot police and UN forces of the Argentine army will try to stop them before they reach Turkish troops. Of the 2,000 who set out, only a handful of teenagers made it to the Turkish line. But the point that they want to go home has been made. You saw your village. How did you feel when you saw your village? I wanted to go here. Uh, Turkish, they are there, and they caught in the guns, and don't, they don't let me to go. They just caught in the guns, and they were trying to make us to go there to shoot us. My blood, my spirit, my soul, everything my father's worked for and I brought up, it's over there, it's in our taken village. And what we want is we want that village back together with the rest of Cyprus that's taken. My grandparents are buried there. It means a lot to me. It doesn't matter if I have a house here in the free part of Cyprus. It's not the same. It's not the same. I shot this film in 1974 when the refugees were fleeing away from their houses in the Sagi of Achna. I mean, you have to have a soul of, of iron not to cry. And to see these people running away because uh, the Turks, they had the power with the tanks to run after them in the fields. It was a shocking experience. Three devastating weeks later, 37% of the island was under Turkish control. Thousands never made it. Some were killed, but the fate of many is still unknown. In Cyprus, they are simply called the missing. Where are the missing? On an island this size, a three-hour drive from top to bottom, how can more than 2,000 people simply disappear? Soon there were reports that some of the missing were still alive. Many suspected that they were being held captive in prisons on mainland Turkey. Before Amnesty International will investigate a case of political imprisonment or murder, it requires evidence. Amnesty has been making persistent inquiries with Turkish officials about the whereabouts of 40 Greek Cypriots who were taken into custody by, Turkish, by the Turkish armed forces in the summer of 1974, 
our inquiries are based on hard information, on the testimony of former prisoners, on radio broadcasts, even on photographs. We believe in some cases these people may have been taken to the Turkish mainland. Nonetheless, Turkish officials have refused to acknowledge the whereabouts of these people or accept responsibility for their well-being. The Greek Cypriot missing persons are mostly uh, soldiers, they are military people, which indicates that they fell in action. But as I say, for political propaganda purposes, the Greek Cypriots are trying to put the blame for this on the Turkish Cypriot side. Turkish Cypriots say that they have no one that's missing. Yes, you have proof that these people were not returned back and they were prisoners. The majority of our missing were arrested by the Turkish army during the invasion and well after the end of the hostilities. Many of our missing were identified in photographs and films taken by foreign journalists uh, during their captivity in prisons in Turkey. Many of them, many of them are still missing. Nikos, how can you be sure that these are Greek Cypriots? Have they been identified? We know all these people because many of them return. And we know who are these people. As well, we know the people who are still missing, who are shown in this photo, but never released by the Turks. Mrs. Konstantinos, who is your son? Yes, this is my son. Yes. Yes, yes. This is my son. Amnesty International has very serious concerns in Turkey. They focus on the imprisonment of prisoners of conscience, the widespread use of torture, and the disappearance and extrajudicial execution of numerous prisoners. This past year, we documented 26 deaths in custody under torture in Turkey itself. It's very terrifying to be arrested and held uh, incommunicado without contact with your family, without contact with a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, you're completely at the mercy of the police, of your captors. And when you're in a situation of civil conflict, where you know there's a lot of violence going on, then you have a strong sense of your own vulnerability and, I would say, mortality. Someone that was uh, released um, testified that he met my brother with a very light wound in a hospital in the occupied areas. So that shows he was arrested. He was in Turkey's hands as well. My missing brother is a very talented person. He used to, he was acting at the theater and he used to uh, sing songs all over the house and he, he loved to paint. He did all these paintings that uh, remind us of him every day. Not that we need the paintings, he's always in our minds. But when you have something in the house, you cannot just stop thinking of him and uh, his love for art. He goes to the army to serve his country and one day he vanishes in front of your eyes and you wonder, you know, my mother sits there for 20 years every single minute wondering where is my baby? Because for our parents, we were, we were their babies even if we were 60 years old. My mom or some friends might say to me, you're doing all this running for the missing persons, you're getting really tired, you have to stop. And I, I say, I'm sure that each one of the missing persons wouldn't mind changing places with me with, and having me in the cell and having them do all the running around. I said, they're, they're in jail, getting, you know, like, they're like candles, melting away every day more and more. When you're in a civil conflict like, like this and a member of your family is taken into custody, is disappeared, and no one takes responsibility for them, you're left with nothing. You're grasping at air. There's no one to visit in the hospital. There's no body to bury. There's no official to complain to. No one accepts responsibility. It's a great tragedy. Greek Cypriots who mourn the 1619 missing gather at the Green Line. Turks blast the mourners with a provocative song. Yeah. 
Sadness turns to anger. Riot cops appear from nowhere. The barbed wire is too sharp and the cops are too tough. Two or three casualties and it's all over. There are also Turkish Cypriots missing, 800. But in all those cases, the missing are believed to be dead. It is true that in, uh, in the fighting which ensued the Greek coup d'etat, that is during the Turkish intervention, uh, people on both sides have been killed. We have people uh, who, who disappeared and we don't know their fate uh, even to this day. We have people, uh, 500 of them, who were massacred en masse and put into mass graves during that tragic period. Uh, we have other missing Turkish Cypriots. Uh, our missing people by far are civilians, which indicates that they were deliberately taken from their places, from their homes, and they were killed. 300 are known to have been killed by Greek extremists and buried in mass graves, which were exhumed in the presence of UN observers. Ruins are all that's left of the Turkish Cypriot village of Sandalar. A lone farmer appeared to be the only resident. Greek soldiers came to our village and loaded all us men in a truck to take us to prison in the city. From the back of the truck, we watched as our women and children were tortured. Then they shot them and burned them. What can I say? The dead are dead, but what about the missing? I believe that the Greek Cypriot government and the Turkish Cypriot leadership both have enough information to begin with. And it's just a matter of a political will and goodwill to start showing, um, exchanging that information to help each other. We are treating the matter as a purely humanitarian affair, away from politics, away from propaganda. Both sides claim never to use humanitarian issues like the missing for political leverage. Both sides are lying. As you know, there was a committee being set up in 81 as a result of the UN resolution. That committee has not produced any results. The Red Cross Committee on the Missing, made up of Greek and Turkish Cypriot officials, has met for 10 years and never published a finding. The committee has not yet gone into the stage of investigation because, as I explained to you, we have first to agree to reach a consensus on the criteria, on the basis of which the investigation will start. At this stage, at this moment, we are in consultation with the other side to reach that concession. concession. Once we've reached a consensus, then the committee will be able to start investigating the files of both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. We've heard from several sources that the Greek Cypriot government knows of the fate of Greek Cypriot prisoners and they haven't released this information to their people. How do you respond to that? Yes, I know, because I am in the problem 20 years now. Nobody, nobody from our side knows exactly what happened to these people. Even for one, Missing person. But if somebody knows about the fate of even one missing person and keep his mouth closed, he's criminal. The Greek Cypriots have the remains of three Turkish Cypriots. Hmm. Is this true? I don't think there's any doubt at all about that. President Claridis has actually said that there are graves in the south and he is perfectly willing to give those up. Uh, to the religious authorities in, in, in the north. It just is a matter for them to actually apply for them. They, they, they're refusing to even do that at the moment. It's been said that if any of the missing are alive and heard what's being done in their name, they would probably commit suicide.
in general, if someone has been disappeared for as long as 20 years, it's very unlikely they are alive. However, uh, recently in Morocco, we were campaigning for the release of disappeared prisoners for 15, for 20 years, and several of them, in fact, were alive. They were held in secret prisons, and they were released as a result of our campaign. So it's not our job to give up hope. It's our job to hold governments accountable and do the best we can to gain information and hope the government will divulge information about what happened to these people. I feel uh, my son is alive. Sometimes I feel near to me. Many times like that. He was missing with the motorcycle because uh, he loved motorcycle and he going with the motorcycle. Not every night, but I dream it. Many, many times I saw him and called me. Mommy, don't cry. I am alive. I come to you. You wait for me, mommy. Many times I saw, I saw him like that. Many, many, many times I saw him. Please, Alexandre, I wait for you. I wait for you. My cousins from the next village invited me for the midday meal. Their farmers in every season brings new hope. Kupepia, rice and lamb wrapped in grape leaves. My glands are salivating. Very good. Then, in the same fields my father and grandfather worked, Side by side with Turkish Cypriots, I helped them with the harvest. <laughs> My cousin blames the mother countries. If the Turks go out of Cyprus, then Greek go out as well, the Greeks, and leave the Greek Cypriot and Turk Cypriot to live in Cyprus alone, without armies, without anything. There have been literally uh, hundreds of negotiations which have occurred and scores of meetings of the most senior politicians on both sides, and really little progress has been made. They are still arguing who killed, who started, who killed who, who killed me, uh, more, who raped more women and all, all, why don't we work on a solution and then get the guilty party into prison or punished or anything? Why do we have to do it the wrong way around? Why do, ha do we have to see who started and not see who is going to finish it? It is high time that the Turkish troops must end their presence on the island the division of the island must be ended and, there should be, and the island should be reunited. Cyprus is a small island to be divided. It's a beautiful island to be the home of both the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. Reunification, first of all, must be totally voluntary on the free will of the two sides. Reunification requires mutual respect. It requires uh, friendship before anything. These are the ingredients of a lasting relationship. The Cyprus story was the story of a broken marriage. We were uh, married uh, in the past in 1960, but this marriage was broken not by us, but by the Greek Cypriots who did not respect their spouse. As a result of that, first we had separation, 
and uh, for a considerable length of time we've had divorce. Now they say that they want to get back, but we tell them that now the world is in a mood of total equality of the spouses who get married. And we demand that equality, we believe it's our right. Let's say we uh, unite again. What's, what's going to happen? I'm going to go and say to this Turkish guy that's born in my house and he's 20 years old now, say, hey man, get out of my house, this is my house. It's not possible. The Turks have achieved what they wanted to achieve. I think that the world is not looking this way now. But in time, in, a, in the next few years, they will look this way and a lot of countries will say, God, we should have done something. There are 1,619 people who are missing in action and it's time to find a solution. So what if both sides agreed to an amnesty to grant immunity for the acts that led to the disappearance of the missing. Files may open, people might remember, and the families of the missing would find what they are looking for. Amnesty may pave the way to peace along the thin green line. One thing Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots have in common is a cheese unique to Cyprus. To see it made is to experience history. The farmer, who never lives on the farm, travels from the village to milk his goats. Goat's milk is heated, then rennet, an enzyme from the stomach of a young goat is added. She stirs with the sign of the cross to bless the cheese. The fat solidifies and sinks to the bottom. Then it is scooped out and formed to shape. Turkish Cypriots call it helim, and Greek Cypriots call it halloumi. Lumi is an acquired taste. It smells just like the goats in the pen. The milk still has enough fat left in it to make anari, which is kind of like feta cheese. Halloumi has been made the same way for thousands of years. And I'll tell you, it's never tasted this good. It's incredible. <laughs> oh, yes. The halloumi is boiled in the liquid again to give it firmness and flavor. It is kneaded, salted, and mixed with mint. 
<laughs> He's finished now. <laughs> but a common taste in cheese is not enough to build an Ashenad. In Lafkara, things are still made by hand. This is the donuts. The side cross is locumales. He pours a bath of carob tree sugar. Very good. Locumales. 